and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and I should go straight in. So, my question this evening, does art history need catastrophe? Well, obviously not, if it looks like this. <laughs> <clears throat> However, the premise of my talk today is that yes, actually, art history does need catastrophe. But why, you may well ask, do we need catastrophe? And what might a catastrophic art history look like? Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Would it be a return to a form of Morellian connoisseurship, of white privileged access to the beautiful fictions of old master painting, privileged gazing, fetishising the tracing fingers of the artist in a series of not very deeply buried subliminal moves of polyamorous desire? Well, yes, that might well be one category of catastrophic art history, in the same category as the man-made catastrophe of Trump's hair, perhaps. The catastrophe of Brexit, as we've just heard that. <clears throat> or the catastrophe of Notre Dame. But these are not the types of catastrophe that I'm proposing to focus on this evening. Rather, I want to take as my opening gambit not an apocalyptic sense of catastrophe, as inherent in Trump, Brexit, or Notre Dame, but instead one of the Oxford English Dictionary's definitions of catastrophe as, quote, an event, oops, sorry. <clears throat> an event producing a subversion of the order, order or system of things. This, for me, is the attraction of the concept of a catastrophic art history. Not the harsh lessons of its violence, but rather the possibilities engendered by systemic change. In geological terms, landscape after catastrophe is remade and reformed into unfamiliar terrain. For example, after a volcanic eruption, a tidal wave, an earthquake, etc. Motion and change replace stasis in a cyclical pattern of environmental transformations which then again becomes stasis. Um, and I'm just showing you here uh, visions of what my title would have looked like in Tenerife, um, according to the Daily Express a couple of years ago, um, and actually what my title looked like last week when I was on holiday there <laughs> with my daughter and her cousin. <clears throat> in geological thinking, catastrophe explains small changes on the Earth's surface that might lead to sudden, dramatic environmental events. But what does it mean for art historical thinking? In her 2014 article entitled Wither Art History, Griselda Pollock considered how we, would, how we could continue to write art history in the West after the traumas enacted on the body by the major genocides of the modern era. In so doing, she reflected on the continued significance of the work of one of the interwar founders of our discipline, Abby Warburg. As she observes, Warburg proposed a different concept of time, not directional, developmental, and historicist, but bending, recurring, repetitive, and above all, traumatic. Warburg thought the nascent discipline of art history failed because it was plotting out the histories of art without returns, or without which resurfaces and recharges. That is, without Nachleben, or afterlife. And she continues, art history fails because in the face of 20th century history, it continues to plot out the history of art without rupture and catastrophe. This is my photo montage of Warburg in his library. <laughs> um, Warburg visiting the Pueblo Indians in the 1890s. <clears throat> his library built in the 1920s. For Warburg, the concept of Nachleben was important to the way in which art historical time should and could be thought. His focus on Nachleben, the afterlife or survival of motifs from classical antiquity, das Nachleben der Antika, via a course to an interdisciplinary visual study of iconology, symbolic meaning, and pathos formulae, formal, pathos formulae, was central to his rethinking the structures of art historical method. As Georges de Ubermann has commented, for Warburg, Nachleben meant making historical time more complex, recognizing specific non-natural temporalities in the cultural world. Didi Ubermann continues, the surviving form does not triumphantly 
outlive the death of its competitors. On the contrary, it symptomatically and phantomatically survives its own death, disappearing from a point in history, reappearing much later, at a moment when it is perhaps no longer expected, and consequently having survived in the still poorly defined reaches of a collective memory. Scholars like Maggie Iverson, Didi Uberman, and Giorgio Gambon have expertly unraveled some of the indeterminate impulses of Warburg's thought, and all point to the idea that fully conscious explanations of the concept of pathos formal remain purpose purposefully elusive. For Gambon, quote, what is unique and significant about Warburg's method as a scholar is not so much that he adopts a new way of writing art history, as that he always directs his research toward the overcoming of the borders of art history. So the overcoming of the borders of art history. It's quite a key term for my thinking. Warburg's method, if we can call it that, entreats us to look again at what we know and recover the moments of temporarily suppressed pain. This, then, is where I suggest that art history means catastrophe. Catastrophe understood as a subversion of the order and system of things, as an overcoming of its own disciplinary borders. An example of such a catastrophic art history at play in my own recent work has been my recalibration of the art histories of Weimar Germany, an example I want to share with you for the remainder of this short talk. In 2014, the British Museum staged an ambitious sweep through 600 years of white German history, as told through a carefully selected range of diverse material objects. Curated by the museum's then director, Neil McGregor, Germany, Memories of a Nation, explored how the country had fashioned and refashioned its fragmentary identity from the Holy Roman Empire through to unification in the 1870s, post-war division, and eventual reunification in 1989. The curatorial narrative moved boldly and fluidly across different regions and times. Visitors encountered artworks by Albrecht Dürer, Peter Kolbitz, and Gerhard Richter. They could marvel at the technological achievements of the Gutenberg printing press and the development of mice and porcelain, as well as explore modernist examples of Bauhaus design and the VW Beetle. Together, such objects reveal the complex jigsaw that constitutes a dominant yet partial view of Germany's ruptured past. But my question, informed by catastrophic thinking, would be, what if one were to recalibrate McGregor's impressive project through the lens of black German scholarship, for example? What would Germany's memories of a nation look like then? Sarah Lennox, Tobias Nagel, Tina Kant, and many others have pointed out how research into the history of the black diaspora in Germany has always been confronted with a complex epistemological framework of visibility and invisibility. As Kant observes, being Afro-German or black German is at once a demand to question what constitutes Germanness and a desire to express a relationship to blackness. Black German identity provokes not only a different conception of German cultural identity, but at the same time contests essential, phenotypical and nationalist definitions of race. And as Sarah Lennox has commented, because the history of black presence in Germany is the history of individuals, not a consequence of the violent mass dispersal of slavery, and only to a lesser degree the result of the European colonisation of Africa, no comprehensive, inclusive and continuous black German history can as yet be written. At present, all that historians, and indeed art historians, can offer are Geschichtsschlitter, historical shards or fragments, resonant, I think, of Warburg's Minnesota, pieced together from incomplete archives. Do you like my endorsement? <laughs> it comes in the wake of Anthony Weaver's endorsement. <clears throat> in 2014, <clears throat> The same year as the British Museum's sweeping narrative through the hegemonic history of white Germany, black German poet and activist Philip Carbo Kupsel, an American born, Berlin based Asoka Esuru Oso, published a collection of poetry and creative writing by black writers in Germany. In their anthology, Arriving in the Future Stories of Home and Exile, 
Hesu Rosso, Cardinal Coxall, and their contributors put forward a series of alternative experiences of the German nation that reclaimed presence for themselves and their peers within national narratives of German identity. Hesu Rosso's introductory essay offers an incisive historical overview of the presence of people of African descent in Germany, from black soldiers in the Imperial Roman armies to Audrey Lord's account of her seminal 1992 visit to Berlin, immediately after the fall of the war. Her opening gambit focuses on the narratives of Saint Maurice, a third century Nubian legionnaire whose relics became central to the Holy Roman Empire. Whilst early German depictions of the saint, such as an anonymous 13th century sculptural rendition on the exterior of Magdeburg Cathedral, or the detailed paintings of Lucas Cranach in his workshop and Matthias Grunewald, unequivocally represent Maurice as black African. By the later 16th century across Europe, in works such as those by Contorno and El Greco, Maurice had been bleached. Um, and the kind of the, the martyrdom of him kind of happens kind of off, off stage somewhere and then it's in the background. <clears throat> As Soroso comments, As the ancient sword and spurs of Saint Maurice proclaim, black German history did not spring from the wreckage of the First and Second World Wars, or even German colonisation, as it was once believed. Black history has been here far longer, and yet, like the body and face of Maurice, has been actively whitened and negligently forgotten over time. Maurice is significant to narratives of German nationhood because, his, because of his centrality to the ceremonies of the Holy Roman, then Austro-Hungarian Empire, for almost seven centuries until its dissolution in 1918. Apart from saints, there were of course other historical exceptions, including the Ghanaian Enlightenment philosopher Amal Afer, who died in, who in, sorry, who in the 1740s wrote a treatise on the rights of the Moors in Europe, likely the first defence of black people written on German soil. Both Affair and Maurice are unusual examples of black Germans whose fabled life stories stand out within orthodox narratives of German history, precisely because of their exceptionalism. Nevertheless, they serve as important milestones in the German national story. They prompt us to, be, be, they prompt us to beware of the occlusions within historicist narratives of nation they are, in Warburg's terms, surviving forms, disappearing from a point in history, reappearing much later, at a moment when they are perhaps no longer expected. As Carlo Kopsel, in his performance poem, A Fanfare for the Colonized, suggests, crushed underneath the broken marble of former empires, lies an entire narrative of the bloody conquest, the colonial scroll parmesis, the interest in the unrest, the beginning and the end. So, does art history need catastrophe? Or, to put it another way, would it, be such a would it be such a catastrophe to change our narratives, alter our course, recalibrate our entire structural premise as a discipline, and thereby arrive in the future? I, for one, think it would not. Thank you. Thank you.